The way we look at our own aging predicts how well we age. So what that means is that if we have a negative view on aging, our uh, chances of a cardiac event come way earlier and cognitive de de decline comes earlier. And the opposite is true. If you have a really optimistic view about aging, you think aging is a time of exhilaration and vitality, then you are gonna be healthier, you're gonna be happier, and you live seven years longer. Our heartbeats were in sync, so the doctor did not hear anything but one ta-dum, ta-dum in his stethoscope. But my twin sister, Caroline, soon differentiated herself. She became captain of pretty much every team on which she played. She had boyfriends and girlfriends. I wanted to be her in so many ways. And although I did go to her high school and got away with pretending that I was Caroline Paul and we played a joke on the entire faculty and student body because we're identical twins, we were different. She was braver than I, more athletic than I, stronger than I. Being nice to everyone was not her priority. Like, I am sorry to say it is mine. Caroline wanted to have adventures, and so she did. She became a hang glider and a paraglider. She got her small planes pilot's license, trained for the U.S. Olympic team as a loser, joined the best all women's whitewater rafting team in the world, and made several first descents with them. She was the first woman to mountain bike the Bolivian Andes. She climbed Denali. Oh, and she also climbed the Golden Gate Bridge, which you can read all about in her first book, Fighting Fire. That book is a memoir of her 13 years as one of the first female firefighters in the San Francisco Fire Department. She was one of 15 women out of 1,500 men. She was also the very first woman in that department on the rescue team, which was tasked with finding bodies in the bay and getting people out of collapsed buildings. <sighs> now Caroline has settled down. She flies a gyrocopter, which is an experimental plane, but truthfully, it's a bumper car kept in the air with helicopter rotors. Caroline also surfs regularly in the San Francisco Bay and gets around the streets of that city on her one wheel, which is an electric skateboard. Not what you expect a 60 year old woman to do, which is why she wrote her latest book. She's actually written seven books. One of them, a New York Times bestseller, and all of them highly praised. She's been on Tim Ferriss's extremely popular podcast three times, and she has a TED Talk on raising brave girls that has over 2 million views. But today we're gonna discuss her most recent book called Tough Broad, From Boogie Boarding to Wing Walking, How Outdoor Adventure Improves Our Lives As We Age. In it, Caroline examines what the science says about aging while experiencing the great outdoors. And she follows amazing women in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s who are still adventuring. It's an inspiring read that will open your mind to all the activities ahead of you as you get older. It's the reason that I was exhilarated about turning 60 because the women in this book and the science behind aging actively are so exciting. So welcome, Twinny, to the show. I am so happy to be here. I can't even tell you. And that's like the best introduction ever. And I've been here a couple times in the past few weeks. Thank you. Wow, that is a long one. one. It's a really good one. I know everything. I didn't have to do much research. I experienced it by watching you all these years. Okay, so let's get to understand more about this book. Tell us why you wanted to write Tough Broad. What was going on that inspired you? Well, I was 55 and I was looking around, for instance, when I was on my surfboard and in, in at Ocean Beach or when I was on my electric skateboard even, or when I was flying my gyrocopter and I would, sorry, I wasn't flying gyrocopter, but I was flying experimental planes. So when I was flying experimental planes and I would see men my age out there with me, but I saw hardly any women. There were men even a lot older than me. And so I began to wonder, like, as I approached 60, was I doing something wrong? Was there something I didn't know? And meanwhile, my friends were really disheartened about aging. They were, um, and I was kind of intrigued by that too. And so I decided to write this book because frankly, I, it was selfish. I wanted to know about my own fulfilling aging journey because I wanted to keep outdoor adventure in my life. And I was wondering if I could justify that. So the book is called Tough Broad, but does it work for men? Oh, it's definitely for men too. 
The thing that I think differentiates it and why I wrote it for only women is, well, first of all, I'm not a man. So I didn't, don't exactly know how aging for men is, but I'm also not um, a lot of these other women in the book. I want this book to be for all types of women, women with no adventurous background. But the big difference that I was knew for sure was that the messaging women get about aging is different from the messaging men get. I'm not exactly sure what men get, but I do know that, you know, Indiana Jones is still running through the tombs on the movie screens and we don't get that. And I saw, you know, men out there um, again when I was doing things. So I became intrigued by what it, what is this toxic messaging that we're getting about aging and why are my friends telling me that they feel invisible? And, you know, it was it became clear that really what we're told as we get older and I've been uh, people have come up to me and said it starts as young as 40 or even 30, that our older age is going to be a time of frail bones, cognitive decline. We're going to be boring. We're going to we're be, we're becoming culturally irrelevant. And why this is so um dangerous is because, well, first of all, we start pulling back. But second of all, it really makes us dread our own aging journey. You know, it's intriguing that you, you say that because Alexandra and I recently, I don't know why it's so recent, but we found out that our audience here on the Switch for Good podcast is um, over 50. And I don't know why that was so shocking for us, but I think it's because I think I'm 30 and she still thinks she's 40. And so we're like, who are these 50 year olds? Oh, wait, that's, that's us. <laughs> that's the, those are the, uh, you know, over 50, the ages of the host. Um, there's, there's so much talk at this age, right? You, you started writing this at 55. I'm 51. Um, and there's, and you, y'all are both 60. I guess I think that our listeners, sometimes we talk about our age. Uh, and there's a lot of science in the book, but there's some thoughts that you have about the five pillars of aging. Uh, I think a lot of our listeners are probably pretty active and maybe many of some of them, but maybe many of them are eating whole food plant-based. So they're very interested about movement, right? And exercise and how to keep young and fit. And I loved your, before we dive into the five pillars, the, what you say about science and the benefits of being outdoors, because it is a completely different experience for me if I ride my bike in the garage, let's say, and you know, look at a monitor, or if I'm outside on a mountain bike ride, I feel totally different when I get home. Until I saw what you learned in the science, I didn't know why. Will you please go through the science about the benefits of being outdoors? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to actually uh, answer that at a little bit of an angle because one of the things I really realized when I was doing this book, well, first of all, I got the contract right before the pandemic. So I was, didn't really know anything about fulfilling aging. And I was certainly just going to throw myself off a cliff, so to speak, with a parachute and go interview women about their own journey and sort of figure it out. But because the pandemic happened and I couldn't interview people in person, I, what I ended up doing was a lot of research on fulfilling aging. And one of the things that was really, it was the most eye-opening was that the way we look at our own aging predicts how well we age. So what that means is that if we have a negative view on aging, our uh, chances of a cardiac event come way earlier and cognitive de de decline comes earlier and... The opposite is true. If you have a really optimistic view about aging, you think aging is a time of exhilaration and vitality, then you are going to be healthier, you're going to be happier, and you live seven years longer. So this was eye-opening. And because I was so intrigued by our mindset as we come into aging, and that was really one of the triggers of the book, because it was why my friends were so negative about their future and talking about, you know, how they wish they were younger. And so this science meant that our mindset is so key to our health. And that, but the science, the scientists are great when they give us this, but they don't give us how to get that positive mindset. And it was clear that sort of mantras and affirmations are not going to do it with the really heavy messaging we get about how hard our journeys is about to be. And I had a feeling that 
the thing that would really help us was outdoor adventure. And the reason I say that is because the things that happen when you go outside are a direct rebuke to everything the messaging says about as we age. So when, when you go outside, it's really hard to feel frail. It's hard to feel that you're on a cognitive decline. It's hard to feel irrelevant because you're outside engaging with the outdoors, which is an uncertain environment asking you to be vital, to be present, and to be focused. Will you talk to us a little bit about the singing of birds and tree chemicals? And I found especially interesting the rounded shapes instead of sharp shapes. I, I literally just ordered an oval table. I'm not kidding you, like three days ago, because I have so many sharp angles of the tables, like the dining room table and where the TV is, blah, blah, blah. And I just, I was like, it's too intense. It's too sharp. It's too masculine. It's too, I don't know. And I, and, and then I read this and I was like, oh my gosh, it's like my, 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 the experience that I'm having of too many sharp things. Like, um, we are when we walk around a city and we have a lot of sharp buildings as opposed to rounded. Will you go into those three experiences, I guess, of outside? Yeah, I had no idea about how medicinal the outdoors was, but I went and visited a woman called Dot Fisher Smith, who was 93 and she was a hiker. And we went on a walk. And the reason I wanted to interview her is because I thought something like walking would get people outside of, of any ilk. Like you didn't have to be highly athletic to walk. And I knew movement was really important. And, you know, the truth is you can get movement in the gym. But while I was with Dot, I did some research after the walk that we did because it was so invigorating in itself. She took me on a suburban stroll, but we stopped and looked at the leaves. We um, diverted across people's yards in order to see like the apple over there. We were, We went on this walk that I had never really done before. And I stumbled on this research about simply being outside because a lot of people tell me, why don't I just go to the gym? And it turns out that nature itself is highly medicinal. And I mean that from the tree chemicals that are emitted are shown to lower your inflammatory markers. Um, the bird song is soothing to our brain, which allows cognitive health. It's sort of a you know, like we understand rest when we go to a gym, how important it is to work your muscles and then rest. Going outside is a rest for your brain because um, it's way more soothing than, for instance, uh, an urban or inside lifestyle. Um, the rounded horizon lines of mountains and the fractal nature, uh, the fractal elements of nature match really well with the structure of our eye, which again means that our brain doesn't have to work as hard with noise. It's not that it's you're not doing good thinking, it's that it's not gonna be diffused by noise and um, you know, things that busy, busy work almost. What does fractal mean? A uh, fractal is uh, when a shape is um, multiplied in different sizes. So a lot of leaves, for instance, have fractal natures. So they, the, you have the leaf shape and then the shape is sort of imitate, well, you have the tree shape, but then the leaf shape is kind of an imitation of the tree. It's like it in proportion, the shapes sort of recede in size, um, but they match each other. That's a fractal. That was a really unscientific definition of it, but it's soothing to our brain. It makes it you know, easier for us to process the important things. In other countries like uh, Japan, where they encourage forest bathing for their citizens because they realize how stressed out people are by their highly urban environment, uh, which is a, basically where they incur they have places they put aside, parks, I guess you would say, where they ask you not to bring your phone and to basically bathe in the forest. So you're Osmosing all those chemicals. Same in Scandinavian countries where they have something called a power trail paid for by the government where 
you can walk along and then a base certain, and then there's guideposts like you might want to sit here and look out there and, you know, take five deep breaths. And all this is in homage to the fact that going outside is really good, not for, not just physically, but for your whole well being. That would be interesting for Americans to get used to that. Sit on this chair for five minutes, this bench for five minutes and breathe. Um, Caroline, what uh, Dotsie asked you about the five pillars and you talked about the positive attitude about getting older, but what are the other four? So when I was doing research, I came upon these and sort of cobbled them together, but I think they're fairly intuitive. You need community. By the way, this is something that we need throughout our whole lives, but which tends to fall away as we age. So it, sort of garners more importance because we have to really be on the lookout because they're not so easily held on to. So it'd be community, novelty, health, um, purpose. And then I added a positive mindset about your own aging because the science says, if you do not have a positive outlook, you will die so much earlier and so much unhealthier. Um, so when I went out and interviewed people, I was on the lookout for what these, what an outdoor adventure could offer. And it turns out most of the time they offer all of those. Even when I went, for instance, and you'd be interested in this, Dotsie, because I went and interviewed the oldest BMX racer, a uh, female racer in the country right now. She's 74. And I thought, well, what does competition do for our neural system as we age? Like, don't we need a little bit of edge? Um, and what really surprised me when I hung out with, uh, Kitty Weston Nauer, also known her racing name is Miss Kitty, is that even though BMX bike racing, which by the way, is not the flips and twists that you do off jumps. When I, when I asked her when her, she taught me how to race around a track. And when I asked her where the jumps, the, where I was going to have to do a little twist or not a flip, but. She said that I watched way too much TV. <laughs> in fact, BMX bike racing is you just go around a track and there's a couple rollers and there's, uh, but you know, it's definitely looks like it's a, uh, it's a very competitive sport. But what I really found when I was there is that it's really about community. Even though each right racer is racing individually, uh, Miss Kitty clearly had this community. She was pretty famous, actually. And I was interested in community because, you know, there's a, the happiness professor, Dr. Lori Santos, do you know her? From Yale. Yeah, she's from Yale. And she says, you know, happy people hang out with other people. That's how, that's one, re how they get happy. And they, she also talks about a deep, not just community, but a sense of belonging. So, Outdoor, an outdoor activity offers this, what she calls a cultural apparatus to kind of um, give you that belonging. Because Miss Kitty, for instance, I mean, she was part of every race. People came up to her to ask her how she was. You know, she would tell them tips about what she saw when they were racing. I mean, there's a, you are definitely part of something bigger. And that's really important. And what we lose as we age. My cousin Tara is getting ready to do a TED talk um, on April 20th, 420, uh, on happiness. And she, that's I, when you said that name, I thought, oh, it rings a bell, but I wasn't sure. But it, she does um, a whole part in the TED talk on looking at that, that, that happiness study that was 30 years long or something. You guys know better, but, but, um, I had, I hadn't heard of it before, but she speaks about the co community and the engagement and the, you know, being with people. And I was like, well, I'm a really a pretty intense introvert. And I was like, that's not true. Are you an introvert? And then you don't seem like you very, 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 I, I, yes. Um, you know, I can talk to one person deeply and richly and become, and that's kind of this point is it, 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 a lot of that study was about, um, you know, deep, rich, loving, int, you know, maybe call them even intense relationships. It, it, I just thought it was in interesting to point out that it doesn't mean that like you go to concerts with people and you go, you know, with 20 people or 50 people or, cause I was like, no, that's not at all what would make me feel, um, 
inspired or, 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 and, and, and fulfilled, but I, it's, it's that, that really deep connection. Am I right on that? As far as like what you found and what you learned from Miss Kitty and this study. And the fact that you're outside in the elements sharing this with someone. So I went and visited Uh down in San Diego and they were, they range from like 60 to as old as late nineties. Um, and I was interested initially because I thought boogie boarding was something we could do as we age. It was pretty easy. I mean, I came in with a little bit of surfers, braggadocio, like, yeah, boogie boarding. It's not really an adventure, but I want to include it because I want to include everybody. And so I went down there and what I found was that, well, I went down there again. Most This has ha- happened to me most of the time where I would go down with a specific idea of what it was going to teach me. And I came out with something uh, completely new. And one of the women who I interviewed named Lorraine Wright, she had no outdoor background before she was sitting on a beach during the pandemic and saw these women in the waves. And they looked like they were having so much fun. Thought, and I think a lot of this, this does happen. You make decisions when you, there's a sort of inflection point, you know, you either have lost someone you love or you've moved to a new town, or in this case, it was the pandemic. And she thought, I, I think I'll try it. It looks fun. And she was immediately hooked. And when I um, asked her why it was so fun, she kind of, it was clear that part of the fun was being with all these other women even though she was had not been that social beforehand. And there's this bonding experience that happens in the cold water and you're all trying to you know get to shore together. And so the outdoor adventure offers this bonding that you do not have to be some suave social person to feel. And you become an integral part of that unit who's having fun. Uh, I was really, my changed my mind about boogie board. I mean, you know what she said to me? She said, Caroline, boogie boarding changed my life. And I was, couldn't understand. I asked her why, you know, that seemed to be a big statement, especially saying it to a surfer who thought boogie boarding on, you know, the whitewater wasn't that exciting. And she said, well, look at me and the, I'm in the cold Pacific ocean and I'm getting tumbled by these big waves And time and time again, this is what I saw. She had upended her own expectations of herself by going out there and suddenly, and just doing that one thing opened up her life. She became more social. She started trying new things in her life. She started, um, she was also scared of heights. So she would, she decided she would tackle that. I mean, the thing about the outdoors that is so powerful and I said it before, but I'm going to say it again, is it's, it offers you a direct rebuke to all the messaging that you're getting as a woman. Because I promise you, none of those boogie boarders were feeling like they're, you know, f- physically weak or boring. They were having so much fun. I just want to clarify everybody to listeners is that because Caroline, you, you, the, in my introduction, I told all these things like flying and, and. Uh, paragliding and, you know, all the stuff that you've done that's very physically challenging and that this book is inclusive of everybody and that you found during this book that um, your idea of adventure, outdoor adventure, was pretty small and that it, it widened as you researched this. Yeah, this was the other thing is I wanted this book to include everybody, people of all financial backgrounds, people of all physical abilities, people of all outdoor backgrounds, people of all races. Um, And so, but one thing that I was a little bit smug about was like, "Eh, you know, my definition of adventure is the real definition of adventure, which was it kind of almost had to kill you a lot of times. But I did, again, want people to get outside because it's so clearly good for you. So, for instance, I went bird watching. And the reason I went bird watching is a lot of the reason I went with dot walking is because I thought this was something that we could all do as we aged. No matter what your physical ability, almost most of us can get outside or at least do it from our porch. And turns out Virginia Rose is actually in a wheelchair and 
She had been in wheelchairs since she was 14. And she had started this group called Birdability, which brings people with disabilities into the outdoors. So I really wanted to write about it. And we went bird watching. And again, I kind of thought, well, it's going to be a little boring, but it'll be interesting and cool for people who aren't really that adventurous. And then I realized a bird watching is an adventure. It had all the elements of adventure. It, we were on a quest. There was all this anticipation of the bird. When we saw the bird, there was exhilaration. There was physical vitality because we walked or wheeled because there were lots of people in wheelchairs, six miles. And I realized that bird watching had all the rhythms of an adventure. And adventure is not about what you're doing. It's how you feel during it. So if you're pushing your uh, comfort zone just a little, if you're feeling physical, physically vital, if you're exploring, you feel exhilaration, you're on an adventure. And frankly, every single thing I did in this book, which ranged from scuba diving with an 80-year-old and bird watching or walking in a park, all of them had the elements of adventure. And I really got schooled in that. Did you know that 45% of Americans are deficient in magnesium? And that is not good because magnesium is so important. It keeps your brain healthy, your bones strong, it helps you sleep and stay regular. It can help prevent migraines and cancer. It is an amazing mineral. And that is why I take Magnesium Breakthrough. I love it because it has seven different kinds of magnesium, which I've actually never seen before in a magnesium supplement. Most of them just have maybe two or three kinds, but you get seven kinds in mag of magnesium in Magnesium Breakthrough in just two capsules a day. And it's gluten-free, soy-free, and vegan. So if you want to up your magnesium game, go to buyoptimizers.com and order Magnesium Breakthrough. Put in the code SWITCH for 10% off, and you could also get up to 32% off plus free gifts. That is buyoptimizers.com and use the code SWITCH for a discount. I want to dive into all because I'm going to share with you some of why that just struck me as uh, so critical. And I hadn't thought of it before to like, you know, part of the five elements of, of healthy, good, you know, um, invigorated aging. We must talk about the wing walking for a hot second, just because I was reading along and you've mentioned some of the things that you did. Some seem not so crazy like bird watching, but you just explained why it's incredible. Uh, and, um, but, but, you know, kite surfing and flying and, and, and everything. I was like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then wing walking, I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> like, what is she saying? I've never heard of that in my life. And so if I could just read like two sentences of an interview that you did, um, I would love to do that. So this is the day of your wing walking lesson, which yes, it is walking out on the wing of a plane when it's up in the air. On the day of her lesson, Paul watched with disbelief as her fellow students went first and then went safely back on the ground, flopped over to the ground, exhilarated. When it was in her turn, she says, I just kept thinking, why am I getting out of the cockpit? Her account in Tough Broad of what happened next is mesmerizing. The horizon curdles falls away, spinning earth, buffeting air, iceberg clouds flashing by. I'm no longer afraid. I am something else entirely. Oddly, I began to laugh. <laughs> and you had discovered one of the most powerful predictors, right, of happiness right there um, and good health right at any age. It was, it, it was the awe, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And this was one. So wing walking for people who don't know is from the barnstorming days when they used to have biplanes and they used to do low aerobatic tricks. And one of them was that people would walk on wings. They don't do this anymore. Um, there is one place that does it in Squim, Washington. So if you want to do it, it's called Mason wing walking. And the reason I did is because I saw a video of this woman who was 71, Cynthia Hicks, and she was uh, I watched her, this video that someone sent me, her clamber up on the wing of a plane. And I thought, I have to talk to her for Tough Broad. And what she told me was, Caroline, you know, when you, you can't imagine the courage you feel when you first pull yourself up on that wing. And I thought, 
oh, well, now I'm going to have to go do it because I need to write about this courage because courage seemed like an, a, something we need as we age. And so I went again with this idea that this is what I was, I was also very interested in what one kind of mind blowing experience could, could help us as we age neurally, like for instance, skydiving is a, is an experience that is way out of people's sort of normal day. And when they do it, it changes them. And I was interested neurally in how this, how it does this. And so wing walking seemed like a good, uh, a good parallel to skydiving. So I, but I am a pilot, so I don't like getting out of a perfectly good cockpit. So I was very reluctant. I was not happy. I was not happy through the whole time. Uh, I didn't really understand the point, but I had to do this because, Cynthia told me. So on the day, uh, and so we, you basically do it all, all day. You sort of practice the actual movements and you're on the ground. And I asked them, well, what's it like when you're at 3000 feet? And they're like, don't worry. Your brain will, your, your muscle memory will take over. And actually it was true, which was really interesting at 3000 feet when the wing waggled. And I was like, oh my goodness, I've been at 3000 feet a lot in a tiny plane. And, but when that wing waggled, I felt like, do I really want to do this? But what Cynthia had told me is you have to get up quickly or else you might not do it at all. So I got up quickly and I, it's not walking, it's crawling, it's slithering, it's anything you can do to kind of get yourself to that king post and then tie yourself in. And then the pilot begins to do loops, barrel rolls, and hammerheads. These are, <laughs> and I went from kind of surly about this whole thing to ecstatic. And I was really curious about what that was when I got down. Cause I knew it wasn't a great adrenaline. I was very experienced in adrenaline. It was something else. And that's when I stumbled upon awe. And it turns out that, re you know, as I handed the book in, there were lots of books coming out about awe and I, I recommend them all, but awe is the feeling you get in the in the presence of something mysterious or, or bigger than you. It's sort of a mix of wonder, fear, and dread. And it turns out that awe is really good for us physiologically, so, you know, our endocrine system, as well as emotionally. And it also turns out that we live in a um, society of anti-awe devices. So our phone, for instance, is a constant anti-awe device because it's telling us to look into this kind of small area and it centers us and it makes us feel like we have power and control. Exactly the opposite of what awe does, which puts us sort of in our place in the universe and makes us, by the way, feel more compassion and more interconnectedness. And all this is really important for us at any age, but when we uh, when we are older, I think we are really primed to appreciate awe. So awe is really good for us. Now, how do you get it? Well, it turns out nature is an incredibly easy way to get it. You do not have to get up on a wing. You, I mean, people feel awe just looking at the night sky or being looking down in the Grand Canyon. But they did a study with um, uh, the uh, Memory Care Institute, I'm, I'm, that's not quite the right name, but in San Francisco, UCSF, where they asked people to walk outside. They were between the ages of 60 and 80. And they, the only real instruction was, they gave them two, two basic instructions. First, look at everything with fresh childlike eyes. That does what they say, what they call is cultivating awe. When you look at things with wonder and openness, and then they had a control group of, of walkers who just did what we usually do, which is look at our phone or think about, you know, who, who we're mad at that day or whatever. And they followed them over eight weeks and they found that the all walkers had uh, measurable differences, statistically significant measurable differences in their inflammatory markers, in their um, depression and anxiety and in a lot of their other physiological markers, that these people basically felt so much more well-being after practicing awe and the simple act of being open to wonder. So you do not have to walk on a wing. You can simply go on a walk. 
outside. Now, also, you know, obviously music, poetry, there's other awe-inducing things. But because I'm such a fan of the outside and how it gives us this incredibly holistic opportunity to be to be well on a on on so many levels, then I say go and induce awe outside. Ooh, the other cool thing is as kind of an afterthought, they said, oh, and could you take some selfies? And so these people took selfies on each walk. And the first selfie was, you know, the classic selfie, their face centered and just their face. But as the walk went on, the, the selfies changed. The face got smaller and the background got bigger. So it was way more background than the person themselves, which is an actual incredible manifestation and metaphor for awe itself. Alexandra, you were afraid that you were going to take over this interview. I am doing that um, right now. I have one more question on awe uh, because it's, I don't know, it just really struck me. And I, I, you've given the definition of it uh, just a moment ago. And I thought that it was that, that all the definitions, I, so I looked it up. I'm like, Oh, I think I'm missing something. I thought it was basically a feeling of reverential respect, right? Like you're saying, looking out over the Grand Canyon. It's just, you just have such a respect for the magnitude of what you're seeing. But the definition is that mixed with fear or wonder, which you have brought in. Dread. And I thought, Oh Dread. my God. And dread. I well, then that even it bring. I know, and that's 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 a tough word to to wrap your head around. Like, oh, I, I would like to have some dread in my life. No one says that, but it instantly answered a question for me that I've had f for probably twenty years, and it may, it took me back to thinking about fear in in track cycling, which was the sport I went to the Olympics in, and the complete and utter terror and dread I felt every single time I would clip into that track bike with no brakes, one gear, and rise up that 44 degree banking where I had to keep a certain speed because if I didn't, I would, my tires would slip and I would crash and slide down and, and thousands of Siberian pine splinters would go under my skin. It, it happened once. Um, and I could also easily uh, break a bone. And I didn't know for all of those years what was bringing me back to it, right? Because I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, thousands, thousands of hours of training, right? Leading into the Olympics. And I remember at the Olympics thinking, this is the last time I ever have to feel this dread and terror and fear. And that was what was bringing me back was the awe. And I don't, I don't know. I don't, I can't think of something now that I'm doing that's really scaring me. I need to find something because it's, it's, it's just the opposite of what I think we think all is and means and, and, um, what it entails. Well, it's not just really scaring you. I mean, there has to be a sense of, um, wonder and mystery and yes. also connection and trust almost. So I interviewed a base jumper. This is the only thing I did not do in the book myself because I know that I'm very accident prone and my family was like, no way are you going base jumping. So I instead was like ground crew for, for Sean, base jumping is considered one of the most dangerous sports in the world. It uh, stands for B-A-S-E is Bridges, antenna spans and earth and those were those are the uh things that base jumpers like to jump off of and they jump off and they free fall and then they throw a parachute and when i visited my base jumper i said oh well um so when you, you throw a parachute and then if that doesn't come out you throw another one and she kind of laughed at me and she said no there's no time for that so when I was a paraglider, we did have an emergency shoot in case our first shoot went, but she has no second shoot. She has no, no backup shoot. So it makes, it's one of the most dangerous sports in the world. But Sean, uh, and Sean started base jumping quite late. She started after a few skydive jumps, which is the way a lot of base jumpers do it. She, um, she was in her forties and she is, her husband calls her the reluctant base jumper because she's so anxious before a base jump, before she does it. And she was, even that day, she was super nervous. And sometimes it takes her a long time even to get off the edge. And I asked her, why do you do it then? If it's so, 
terrifying. And I think what she would have said if, if I had known about awe at the time was that there's the aspect of awe. But what she told me instead is there's this silence. So when she first jumps, there's this incredible, I mean, almost spiritual silence. And then she throws her parachute and, and flies to the ground. So I think f for her, she gets off that cliff because she knows if she didn't, she would be missing an opportunity. For her, it's for that silence. But I think also what she's saying is awe. Caroline, you wrote the book Gutsy Girl, which is was for 8 to 12-year-old girls. I mentioned it in the intro. It encourages them to get outside and have adventures, uh, go out of their comfort zone. So we talked about the messaging that older women get, that we become invisible when we're older because we're told that we're really not valued as much anymore because we're not young. And what's the messaging that girls get different from boys that affects women as they get older? So when I wrote Gutsy Girl, I was very interested in the way that girls seem to lead with fear and boys led with bravery. And it became clear to me that we encourage girls to be scared because we, not because we want them to be sort of, you know, um, receding people, but because we think it will protect them. We think if they're scared, they won't walk down that dark alley. They won't talk to that stranger. Um, and we also have a sense that, well, they did this in study of they watched parents on a playground and it was around this fire, this sort of playground fire pole. And they saw that moms and dads both discourage their daughters from playing on that pole. And if the girl still wanted to play on that pole, then they would assist her. But they saw that with boys, moms and dads would encourage the boy to play on that pole, even if he didn't want to. And they would, sh they would show him how to use it on his own. So the messaging starts really early that girls are helpless. They need other people to make decisions with them or for them. And boys, on the other hand, should just push through everything and learn to do it on their own. And what that does is that shows up in later life with all these things that we then as adults try to shed, which is our timidity, our need to check with other people about decisions, our general confidence, our imposter syndrome. Uh, and so I've all, I guess I've always been interested in the subtle subliminal societal messaging that we get. I do think that tough broad is not gutsy girl because we're different now. We're, we're at a different stage in our life. We're not 12 anymore. And, but still it is about overcoming that subliminal messaging, which guides us in all these really um, subtle and insidious ways. Because the power, again, I saw this over and over when I interviewed for women for Tough Broad, the power of upending your own expectations of yourself means that you, once you start opening up your life like that, it just keeps going. You start doing more and more things. When we were kids, we couldn't say Alexandra, so it became Caroline and Donda. We were born in 1963, which meant that we, we, when we were like nine, Title IX came, we were kids, which allowed access to sports for girls. And it started to sort of lay a new, different foundation, a different expectation for what girls could and could not do. But it was still pretty new. So we're really at the forefront of that. So it's hard for me to say um, if you know, if it's the messaging our parents got, or if it's simply that there just never was exposure, it's some alchemy of all of that. I mean, the, people have been asking me, do you think women younger than you are going to have the same toxic messaging that, that your generation seems to have had? And I can't really say, but, um, you know, people that I've talked to have said this dread about aging, about how we're going to become so irrelevant after the currency that, that we are valued for, which is basically, you know, having kids and um, 
caregiving uh, partners and and just our general caregiving abilities and our looks, all those start to change as we age. And so, you know, facing this new identity that we ourselves are, are thrust into with our changing looks and our kids out of the house and uh, frankly, also post post menopausal, you're, you have a completely different um, relationship to caregiving now. So the things we're valued as, as a mother are changing. So it's not that we're less empathetic, but they have done studies that show that af- after menopause with these, um, you know, with this change in sort of oxytocin, you become more, not self-centered, that wouldn't be the word, but more um, self-actualized, I would say. It becomes, and that's a really powerful time, which is why it's such a shame that we might be wasting it by receding and feeling that we're of lesser value. Because actually, and this was kind of amazing too, I mean, my mind was blown when I heard about the science behind mindsets and how important it was to have a really good mindset or we could actually die earlier. Um, the the other thing that was be, became evident throughout when I was writing the book is women who are older than me to a person said their 60s was their favorite decade, not the dewey 20s or the you know striving 30s or the 40s where you're settled and you think you know who you are the 60s were their favorite decade that was eye opening that's your mom right your mom said oh i wish i was 60 again when she was going on a walk when she was in her 80s yeah my mom told me that yeah my mom was a big influence for this book like i looked around and i saw that my friends were so disheartened about aging but i actually wasn't and that was because our mom really blossomed at 40, at 50. And then again, at 60, after she moved to a new town, she had her, she and her boyfriend of 20 years had split again, an inflection point. And she didn't know anybody. And she thought, well, I guess I'll join a, this biking group that I've heard about because she knew how to, she had a bike. It was a old, you know, heavy kind of Mary Poppins bike but she thought maybe this will be a good distraction. And instead it became a huge passion and it really changed her. And I write about that in the book because not only did we watch this as kids, but it, she herself was my own subliminal messaging about aging. I saw her get happier and happier as she aged. That contained several of the pillars, which is community, health, obviously, purpose, because she organized some rides. And so she um, felt like she was helping and being, and then of course, novelty, because she hadn't done this before. Can you talk a little bit about why novelty is so important for us? Because um, I think that a lot of people might, th- I just really want to make sure our audience doesn't think that they have to go wing walking to get what you're talking about. And I know you've said it, Caroline, but still, I want to just that novelty can be so many things and especially novelty in the outdoors. Yes. So novelty is really important to us because unlike what many of us seem to believe, the science is clear that our brain keeps growing. We keep making new brain cells, even as we age. And then if our brain does start to sort of have some issues at very older age, what, what our brain does is they make, different neural pathways to solve decisions. So in fact, what happens they've seen is that older people often have different thinking, sort of more, we could almost say more innovative than their younger, first of all, their younger selves and the younger people around them because they're literally thinking differently because our brain is incredible. It, the plasticity keeps going. It's sort of like they're building new highway systems all the time, but we have to coax it to do that. And to and novelty is a surefire way. There's also rest and there's also eating well, but novelty fires your brain uh, in ways that that keep it healthy. And of course, being outside is an all constantly uncertain environment. I mean, you can you can try to handle everything, but you know, it might rain or you forget 
the coffee, which would be terrible on a camping trip. You know, things happen and you have to adjust. So that's why being outside is is so great. I was interested in memory because that is something that tends to fall away as we age and we're all nervous about. And what it turns out that navigation and memory are in the same part of the human brain. And this scared me because I am not good at navigation. I am constantly um, lost. I do not know where North, South, East, or West is. And it's just getting worse. And the reason is, is because I no longer navigate. I don't use a paper map. All I do, and most of us, is follow a blue dot. So it turns out GPS, which they haven't done a lot of studies, but they will, is really bad for our brain. Because if you're not constantly navigating, you're not improving the same area that holds memory. So I went and tried to find uh, someone who hikes with a map and compass. Well, it turns out there aren't, I couldn't find someone, but you know, it was, it's hard to find. Um, I know they're out there. Please don't make phone calls into switch for good saying I, I camp with a map and compass. Most people still go out with, you know, their phone and a backup battery and they think we're good. But I found an orienteer, someone who does the sport, the very obscure sport of orienteering here in the United States. It's very popular in Europe and in Scandinavia, but here not so much. And it's basically what she called it is running with a map and compass. So you run through terrain and you um, use your map to find certain checkpoints. And then you try to be the fastest after hitting each checkpoint to the finish line. And and, and in doing so, I was interested in, you know, the mechanics of the brain. You know, it, here's what's fascinating to me. So memory champions, you know how they m memorize like pi to the 10 thousandths? I mean, it, it takes 10 hours sometimes. I think the champion, it took him like 10 hours to recite the decimal point of pi. He, he holds the world record. Well, the way people memorize things is they create a location in their brain. So in their head, in their mind. So it could be a house, could be the house they grew up in. And then they put, let's say it's pie. They put numbers in specific parts of that house and they walk through the house in their mind and recite the numbers. So I'm at the banister. That's four. I'm at the, my favorite windowsill. I used to sit out. That's six. And they, so that, is how people, and they knew this back in Roman, ancient Greek times, they call it the method of loci, that navigation and memory are interlinked, intertwined irrevocably. So if we start losing our navigation, we start losing our memory. We need to get outside and navigate with a paper map. Or we can't, I'm, I'm just like, you gotta know we're north, south, unless I'm at the ocean, I, I sort of know, but I, I cannot, look at the sun and figure anything out. Then don't do the navigation part, do the positive mindset part, because they've also shown that if you have a positive mindset about your own aging and you have that Alzheimer's gene, you you have a very, like a 40, 40, 50% chance of not turning that gene on if you have a positive view of your own aging. So I'm sorry, you're not going to navigate for your brain, but do that for your brain. I'm going to do lots of other things, I promise. <laughs> not that I'm not going to start trying to navigate. It just was never naturally in there from a super young age. In your book, you talk about how you have a diverse bunch of women that you've spoken to, and they range in different ages, races, socioeconomic classes, et cetera. And, and when you write, you, you always write their race, and even when they're white, which most authors don't do if they're white, they just just th that person doesn't have a race because it's assumed it's right white and everyone else does. Tell us why that was important and why you felt that it was really important to interview people like Miss Kitty, who's African-American and Sean, who's uh, the base jumper, who's African-American and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, the outdoors is good for all of us, no matter where we come from. And of course, no matter what our age, but I'm especially interested in us as we age. So, and that's all of us. So but the outdoors has always been very unwelcoming, frankly, to, well, to women, but also to people of color. 
And there's a couple of reasons for that that are that are shocking, which is that national parks didn't even desegregate until 1964. So that means, Donda, we were born in 63. So our peers whose parents were black or brown, their experience of the out, they didn't have an outdoor experience because it was so much harder to access and it was very, very unwelcome. A couple other reasons is that there was redlining where you know, institutionally people of color could not get the kind of financial help that white people could get in buying houses, getting loans, business loans. And so going outside as a leisure activity, there just wasn't as enough leisure time because they had to work so much harder to build any sort of wealth at all. Uh, and finally, there was sundown towns, which meant you could not get caught after dark as a person of color in certain towns because they were all white and you would frankly get lynched. So what this did is it, it meant that this idea of exploring uh, was, could not be part of certain cultures. And I mean, more, even more recently, let's say the outdoor retail industry does not market its wares to people of color. It has just started to, but for years on covers of outdoor magazines, it was white men and then it was white women, but no people of color. So there was a general sense that people of color did not want to go outside and that they were not out there. And of course, that is a self-perpetuating um, thing that happens. So then now people grow up not seeing role models that and the outdoors continues to be some sort of place they shouldn't be. And I think that that means we're going to be not living uh, long as long. We're not going to be as happy, you know, so we, the outdoors needs to be for everybody. So I wanted to make sure that I interviewed a wide range of people, including African-American, Asian-American. Um, I was all Americans. I stayed in the United States because I wanted to offer people the, um, clear sense that there were people like them out there. Oh, and it, yes, and I, I was very clear about talking about people's race because again, as a writer I, and a reader, I see a lot when an author will uh, describe somebody, they will suddenly describe race. And it turns out that they're doing it for people who are brown or black, but they never say white people if they are a white author. And that's because it is, they are assuming that that's, uh, the people will know the person's white, which then sets up this very subtle, subliminal message of its own, that white is the norm. And the outdoors is for everybody. So the norm is everybody. And so that's why I was very clear that's the way I wanted to write this book. So thank you for asking that question. A lot of people don't ask that question. They don't notice that. We have a very diverse audience too. Dotsie was talking about how we have... Um a lot of people over 50 as an audience, but we also have a very diverse audience. So yay. Yay. And there's so many um, groups out there, you know, black girls surf, uh, brown girls run, uh, you know, block a lot of bird birders that go out in groups with as people of color, because it, it still feels unwelcome to be among um, predominantly in predominantly white spaces. Totally understandable. Hopefully, uh, you know, that'll start to change. I have a question on <clears throat> marriage or long-term partnerships, relationships, as it relates to all, because I'm, you know, clearly hung up on that from the beginning of this podcast. I just, it was like a, just, it was a mind bender and opener for me. So thank you for that. Uh, and I was thinking about it in terms of um, my marriage and, and Alexandra's too, because we, we, we talk about our relationships, sex a lot <laughs> on the podcast and off and, and how it changes, right? We've both been in, she, she's 10 years ahead of me, but both in, in age and in, in marriage or, or maybe 12. But um, I'm curious if the all changes and because you're an all expert, right? We've been clear <laughs> on that, right? Um, and I, I, it made me think about my relationship with Kirk and when I, fell in love with him in um, the beginning. It was, I was in awe of his body because 
very, very physical, right? When you start a relationship, his, his beautiful, thick black hair, his independence that was so sexy to me, his athleticism and, and, and his, I think his free thinking too. And now when I, I thought about it yesterday and I thought of the things I'm in awe, it's, it's, his business acumen, his, his drive that he has, the courage that he shows. Um, and, and honestly, the way that he still loves me after all of these years. And those are really different all experiences. I mean, they're, 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 to me, they feel very different. They read very different. And I'm wondering how all changes over our lives. And are we in the driver's seat of how that, of how that can change? Um, because you see some couples sometimes, you know, in their seventies and they're at dinner and they're not talking to each other like this. And, and I, it's Kirk and I'll joke. I mean, at some point you run out of things to talk about, I'm assuming, but, um, keeping that all in a relationship seems important. Well, if you can go on an all walk just in a small park in San Francisco and elicit all from, and this was a walk. You know, it's funny. I got to look and see if they did the same walk. But just that instruction of like, look at it with fresh eyes. So you kind of refresh. The other thing is that I forgot to mention. So you're saying like, look, look at your partner with fresh eyes. Well, we think we know your relationship. our partner. This is very key. Right. Like we always think we know them, but in fact, we really don't. We know a lot about them, but there's our positive. Our partner is constantly changing, just like we are. So we never know everything. But the moment you think you know everything, that is going to be a problem because then you're not open or willing to be. I guess awed. You're right by your partner because awe inherently in it is that sense of mystery. There's always a sense of mystery. And so one, I think that would be, if the iPhone is one of the awe killers, I would think, I would also say, think, thinking, you know, exactly what your partner is going to say and do at every time, every moment, and that, you know, all about him is also an anti-awe device. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that if you can elicit awe, wing walking, which would be the metaphor for the beginning of the relationship where your sort of mind is just kind of, you're just kind of thrown into awe. I didn't ask to be awed. I was not looking at things with fresh childlike wonder at all. I was just strapped to the king post, enduring loops and barrel rolls, all was kind of thrown at me. And I think that's probably the beginning of a relationship. And then after the all walk is where you really want to be present and conscious. That's the other thing is I, if I can make it sort of bigger to the outdoors again, because the outdoors rocks is that the being present is really key to well-being and to awe. So being present with your partner is like when you're be, being present outside in an adventure. And again, an adventure is almost easier because it's sort of natural when you're walking on a trail and it's dropping off at one side, you're going to be really present about your next step. You probably don't think of your relationship with your husband as walking on a trail with a cliff on one side. So you have to ask, you have to sort of, tr you have to encourage yourself to be present. But yeah, I mean, I think awe, awe yeah, awe, it still has its elemental features. It just might be something you might have to tr dig deeper to access. I'm going to work with him on that. And then I'm going to blame you if he gets, starts to feel squirmy on the couch. <laughs> you just don't know everything about him. So you want to be like, I want no, to I find out. That. I want to find out. Every day, yeah, right? I want to find out more. Yeah. I want to find out more. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do say it, you know, in my head all the time. Yeah, I know. He's, I know what he's going to say about this. And I need to stop that. Well, when I went on this walk with Dodd Fisher Smith, it was a walk through a suburban, uh, town. We were on sidewalks. We did actually go to a park and we went to a pond, but there was nothing inherently spectacular about it, but she made it spectacular. She would stop. She would quote poetry. She would look closely at a leaf. She'd tell me that's where a heron used to, you know, roost. Oh, that's this, oh, this pond here. I saw this kind of bird there last time. So you have to work at it sometimes. Thank you for that relationship advice, Carolyn. That was a really good answer, actually. You have to say. It's a metaphor. Yeah. <laughs>
Uh, I like the metaphor about wind walking versus walking in a park and with fresh eyes. That that's a very very good relationship uh, metaphor. So, what would you recommend uh, to someone who says, "I'm really inspired by your book to try something," or by by this podcast to try something outside of my norm? Where do I start? And um, both you talk about two types of opening up, and one of them is the novelty one, like doing one thing that's really out of your comfort zone. And then there's also the um, changing inside and developing new habits. So speak to either or both. Yeah. So I think the power of upending your own expectations of what you can and cannot do is, is so amazing. So small steps is fine. You do not have to wing walk. You do not have to learn to fly a gyrocopter like I did for the book. You don't have to scuba dive, which is also a big endeavor. You can go snorkeling. You can say yes to somebody who says, do you want to go on a walk? Anything that kind of makes you, um, that here's one thing Virginia Rose said to me, she's a bird watcher. She said, unearth your inner explorer. She is your best self. And it's right. Like anything that feels like a tiny bit of exploration, don't turn away from that. That's adventure. So, Sean Brokeman, the base jumper, is also a personal trainer, and she trains a lot of older women. And they come to her the way a lot of older women go to trainers, which is they want to lose weight. Uh, they're in their 40s, 50s, and 60s and older. But they come, they say, I want to lose weight. Actually, they don't say that. They say, I want to get fit. But what they really mean is they want to lose weight. And But what she sees, and she told me this, is actually... I noticed there's something even more. They want adventure. And they have had a life of, you know, they're in their marriage, they have kids, they have routines, they want adventure. But they're also tell her, oh no, I would never be able to mountain bike like when I was a kid. All the messaging that we get as older women is evident to her because they resist um and say they can't possibly get on a mountain bike. They're too old. And so what Sean does is ask them, what did you do as a kid? What made you happy as a kid? And she kind of starts there. And so your outdoor life, if you have none, and most of these women started late in life that I talked to, can start with wondering what used to make you happy and try that. Or say yes to a friend or do what Cynthia Hicks, the wing walker does. She was a lifelong adventurer, but as things started to fall away, as she aged because she had cancer, um, so she felt weaker. So she let some things go like scuba diving and uh, downhill skiing. And she said, you know, she was one of the most grateful people actually that I've ever uh, interacted with. She had gratitude about everything. And she said, you know, I scuba dive for 30 years. That was great. I, I, I'm, I'm ready to move on. She, she just wanted to embrace adventure in any way she could. She knew she just had, simply had to adapt. What she would do is she would simply type in to the internet search bar, something fun to do here. And she would look what could be fun. And that's how she came upon wing walking. But a lot of women use the internet or meetups to find ways to get outside. And sometimes they didn't even know people. Well, and for instance, another woman that I interviewed, Vijaya Srivastava, who learned to swim at 68. She had no background at all in the outdoors. She told me that the only thing she had ever done that was even active was badminton. She had emigrated from India and she was here in California. And she, her doctor said, mm, you need to change some of your numbers, you know, you get your blood pressure down. I think you're maybe a little overweight, et cetera. Oh, uh, you need to do some exercise. And don't you have a pool in your condominium that you live at? And, and Vijay is like, yes, but I don't know how to swim. And the doctor said, I prescribe you lessons. You should go learn to swim. And so Vijaya simply went and enlisted a friend who also didn't know how to swim. And together they went on this swimming journey that upended Vijaya's, again, expectations of herself and changed her life. She, from swimming, she started doing yoga. She started walking the hills of uh, behind her house. Uh, she's 
she said people said that she looks better, she seems more confident, and yeah, just that little inflection point. And asking a friend, by the way, is key. I think enlisting someone to be accountable and to have fun with really can get you outside. So an outdoor practice is great, but if you can't do that, just do one thing and see where that leads. This is some incredible advice. And I feel like everybody listening is going to want all seven books, not just Tough Broad, but tell them where they can get your books and especially this newest one. Your nearest independent bookstore, for sure. I mean, the book uh, Tough Broad will be everywhere. The The other books um, can be also, you can order them or find them uh, how you usually find books. They're all in print. So, And where can we find you, Caroline? I can be found intermittently when I'm not outside on the Instagram at, at Caroline M B Paul. That's Caroline Michael Bravo P A U L at, and that's my handle there. And then I'm on the Facebook and I'm on the LinkedIn. Um, I don't know my handles, but I'm pretty easy to find on the internet. I think you're Caroline dot Paul dot seven fifty. Oh, Donda, thanks. For no oh, there you have it, Donda. That's so sweet. Aww. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Twinny, for coming on. Appreciate oh, thanks it. Thanks for having very, me. Very I much. love your podcast so much. You guys are so give it so much great information, so much inspiration, so many interesting people. I've learned so much. I love Switch for Good. Thank you.